Landscape designers work on a canvas that is distinctly different from other art forms. The art is always changing as the plants grow, environmental conditions change, and people use the space. For this reason, landscape designers use a design process that systematically considers all aspects of the land, the environment, the growing plants, and the needs of the user to ensure a visually pleasing, functional, and ecologically healthy design. Good landscaping begins with a good design and includes insulation and maintenance. When any of these three fail, the entire landscape also fails. I'm Dr. DeBusk and this video discusses creating and maintaining a landscape plan. There are two ways to create a landscape plan, hand-drawn or computer-generated. Both methods produce excellent results. Drawing instruments such as paper with a pencil or pen and basic drafting equipment such as a ruler, drafting bench, and a few other pieces are necessary to produce a planting plan. The computer-aided design, CAD program, is commonly used to produce computer-generated landscape plans. In recent years, the use of computers in the generation of landscape plans has become very popular. However, it is still important to be familiar with the preparation of both hand-drawn and computer-generated landscape plans to increase your job prospects. The purpose of the landscape helps determine design. For example, the landscape may be used for aesthetics, to reduce noise, or to direct traffic. To satisfy the customer, the designer must learn about the customer's preferences and expectations for the completed project. At the initial session with the client, the following questions should be addressed. What is the purpose of the landscape? How many people will reside at the location and what are their ages? What are the plant preferences? Find out the client's likes and dislikes in plant material and inanimate objects used in landscapes. How much work are the clients willing to put into the landscape? Do the clients want the landscape to be high maintenance because they are avid gardeners or low maintenance because they do not like to work in the garden? How much is the client willing to spend on a project? Find out the range the client is willing to spend. Is a service entrance needed and what specific utilities will be needed? What rules govern the landscape design? Discuss the rules and regulations for development with the client so you both have a clear understanding of what is and what is not allowed in the development. Site analysis is a survey of a site to determine the presence, distribution, and characteristics, both natural and synthetic, along with environmental conditions at the site. Studying the site to identify its natural features helps the designer determine the appropriate treatment of the site to achieve the client's purpose. The landscape architect should gather the following information when visiting the site. The general landscape at the site and any regulations on fencing, types of plants that can be used, and others the size of the lot, dimensions, or space available for the project to determine the variety, number, and size of plants or inanimate objects such as pools and fountains that can be used. The terrain, drainage, soil, climactic conditions, rocks, natural features such as streams or ponds, and other features that will affect the landscape. The design and size of the structure to be landscaped for the poor proportionality of the design. After the site characteristics have been determined, the landscape designer may begin to create the plan by breaking down the site into public areas, areas that will be seen from the street and areas first impression visitors get, private areas, areas out of view of the general public and typically where decks, hot tubs, and patios are located, and service areas, areas near the rear entrance generally isolated from public and private areas where utility accessories and unattractive items such as garbage cans are stored. These are usually shielded from view by fencing or plant material. Selection of plant materials when implementing a plan requires knowledge of plants. Five general categories of plant materials are used. Trees, shrubs, ground covers, vines, and flowers. Many sources of information may be considered carefully when selecting plants to be grown in the landscape. Common and scientific names should be known. Determine whether the plant being used is deciduous or evergreen. Trees and shrubs are classified by height and spread, which is valuable information to the landscape architect. Whether the plant is perennial, biennial, or annual determines whether it needs to be replaced annually, biannually, or in the case of a perennial, not for a number of years. It is important to know the special features of the flowers and fruits. For example, the fruits of the female ginkgo have a foul odor that is not recommended for a residential landscape. Color can come from leaves, flowers, bark, fruits, and inanimate objects in the landscape. Plants are selected for their year-round color, not just for their flowering colors. Questions about the soil at the location include whether it is well or poorly drained, 
has good or bad nutrient holding capacity, is typically acidic or basic, has many rocks that need to be removed, and so on. A knowledge of pests at a given location is extremely valuable information when selecting plant material. The hardiness zone and what plants can be grown in that zone is an important factor to consider. Light requirements for the plant should also be determined carefully, full sun, shade, or partial shade. Water requirements must be understood because different plants have different water requirements in order to live and grow. Design of plantings begin with the outdoor room concept. The outdoor room has the same boundaries as an indoor room, outdoor floor, outdoor ceiling, and outdoor walls. The outdoor floor is the ground covering, which in most cases is turf, sand, gravel, brick, wood, water, and other materials. Whereas the outdoor ceiling is the upper limit of the landscape, which consists of covered patios and trees. The outdoor walls of the room set the boundaries, which consist of flower beds, shrubs, and fences. Arrangement of plant materials in the outdoor room uses four kinds of plantings. Corner plantings create the frame of the outdoor room. Line plantings create the walls of the outdoor room. Foundation plantings are located along the walls or foundations of buildings, and accent plantings create an area of particular beauty or interest in a landscape. Today, computer graphics can show the final size of plants in a given landscape, which allows the landscape architect to see how the planting will look in 5, 10, or 20 years. What does the term sustainable landscaping or gardening mean? In Florida, we call this Florida-friendly landscaping. It is an attractive landscape or garden that is in harmony with the environment and requires minimal resource inputs such as fertilizer, pesticides, fuel, time, and water. One of the key factors when preparing a good sustainable landscape or gardening plan is water conservation. There are two options when developing a water efficient landscape. First, plan an entirely new landscape. Second, develop greater water use efficiency in an existing landscape. For most situations, the site can be broken down into three major water use areas. However, there are some landscapes where only one or two may be needed. The three zones are determined by the water needs throughout the year. In the low water use zone, plants do not receive supplemental watering after they have become established. The only source of water comes from rainfall, even during drought periods. In the moderate water use zone, plants receive supplemental water only during establishment and during times of drought. When selecting plants for this zone, it is important to select plants that have good drought tolerance but not to the same extent as those in a low water use zone. In the high water use zone, plants are watered whenever needed. High water use areas are used to keep an area green and attractive at all times. Such areas include the front of a home or by a patio area located at the side or back of the home. When planning a new site or adding to an existing site, it is important to choose plants for most of your landscape that can survive short periods of heat and water stress. Selecting plants for high water use zones is relatively easy. Practically any plant that will survive in a location's climate can be used. Plants selected for moderate water use zones should form large, deep root systems, giving them the ability to tolerate brief periods of low water. It is a little tricky to select plants for low water zones. However, consultation with a local extension agent or observing local pl native plants can help. Examples of plants with a requirement for low or high water are shown in the table. When using grasses in a low water requirement zone, a number of factors should be expected. First, turf will experience browning during the summer months when there is no rainfall for 14 or more consecutive days. Second, summer dormancy can occur under prolonged drought conditions. Leaf blades typically die, but the stems, crowns, and roots survive. Third, in cases of severe drought, there can be excessive loss of turf cover even after natural rainfall is available. Turf requiring occasional watering in a moderate water use zone includes zoysia grass. In addition, grasses from the low water use category such as bahia grass can be used in this zone. It is important to water deeply and infrequently to promote deep root growth. When conditions become dry, grasses will wilt, turning a purple-blue color. The leaves will fold and roll at this point. It is key to wet the soil to a depth of at least one foot. Turf grown in a high water use zone, such as St. Augustine grass, must be watered at the first sign of wilting. In general, to conserve water and turf, select grasses that require less watering. Make sure to use plants that develop a deep root system through proper watering. Mow tall and frequently. This promotes deeper roots and shades the soil surface and fertilize properly with nitrogen. 
To maximize the efficiency of water usage, it is important that the soil is tilled as deep as possible and to increase aeration, drainage, and nutrient and water holding capacity of the soil. Plants grown in deep, high quality soils are very efficient in their use of water, whereas plants in soils that are shallow, rocky, and have a hard pan are not efficient in using water. In many cases, landscapes have poor and shallow soil that must be improved when establishing low water requirement areas. Soil improvement can be achieved by tilling as deeply as possible prior to planting, and if a hard pan exists, breaking up the soil and removing any large objects. If the soil has too much clay, sand is added to increase aeration and drainage. If the soil has too much sand, peat moss or compost is added to increase nutrient and water holding capacity. During the improvement process, it is key to have a soil test run to determine the acidity or alkalinity of the soil as well as its fertility levels. The soil should be adjusted with respect to fertility levels and pH to maximize nutrient usage. By improving the soil structure and fertility, plants will establish quicker and be able to survive under moisture stress. Once the proper plant selection is made, the soil is properly prepared, and the plants are in the ground, it is important to make sure they are properly watered. New plants have a limited root system and will need supplemental water to get established. During very hot, dry weather, one watering per week should be enough to prevent damage. It is key to closely examine the new shoots that develop during the first flush of growth in trees and shrubs in the spring to make sure they are exhibiting normal growth patterns. Once plants are established and growing well, additional watering can be discontinued. If normal growth is not observed, continue to supply supplemental water until normal growth patterns are observed. In all three water use zones, mulching is very beneficial because it conserves soil moisture by blocking evaporation, keeps the soil cool, and reduces weeds that compete for moisture in the soil. There are many materials that can be used for mulch, but organic materials are generally thought to be the best. Mulches should be fine textured and non-matting. Examples include wood chips, pine needles, straw, and others. Rock mulches will control weeds and hold soil moisture when used in sandy areas. However, in sunny spots, they are not recommended. You should apply a two to three inch layer of mulch. If you add too much, often called the mulch volcano, the plant may not get enough oxygen to the roots and the roots will begin circling the plant, strangling it. The efficient application of water is key to maximize water use efficiency. The most efficient watering systems are soaker hoses and drip irrigation, while overhead sprinkler irrigation is generally less efficient. The goal of any irrigation system is to provide plants with water while minimizing waste. By zoning an irrigation system, areas containing turf can be watered separately and more frequently than ground cover shrubs and trees. Both sprinkler and drip irrigation should be incorporated to achieve water conservation in the landscape. Sprinklers are most commonly used in turf. The two most common types are hose-in sprinkler and the permanent underground system. Both systems require little maintenance and apply large volumes of water in a very short period of time. When using sprinkler irrigation systems, it is important to make sure that the heads are properly adjusted to avoid watering driveways, roads, parking lots, etc. A properly adjusted sprinkler head delivers large droplets which are less susceptible to evaporation and wind drift compared to delivering a fog or fine mist. The proper time to water when using sprinklers is during the morning to avoid excessive waste through evaporation. Drip irrigation provides more efficiency than sprinkler irrigation because it slowly adds water to the soil minimizing waste through evaporation or runoff. Healthy plants can tolerate more stress than plants that are weak or damaged. When maintaining a sustainable garden or landscape, it is important to monitor disease or insect problems that may develop and to implement proper control methods as needed. In addition, mechanical damage to plants by hitting the trunks of trees with a lawnmower or with string trimmers should be avoided. Pruning can be an important tool to remove dead or diseased plant parts as well as reduce the amount of foliage that is losing water. It is important to be careful when pruning because severe pruning opens up the plant to more sunlight and thus more water loss during the summer months. In lawns, make sure to follow the one-third, two-thirds rule, which is to remove only one-third. For example, the grass should be mowed at a height of three inches if a two-inch height of grass is desired. However, in lawns, allow grass to get taller in non-irrigated areas during drought periods. Some grasses will go dormant, but others will benefit from the extra shade and additional photosynthesizing leaf area resulting from the longer leaf blades. During drought periods, raise the normal mowing height 25 to 50 percent. 
The proper fertilization is necessary to maintain good plant vigor. However, it can be harmful during drought periods when water is limited. If plants need nutrients, delay fertilization until fall or spring when conditions are more ideal and there is enough water available for plants to easily absorb the nutrients. Reducing resources for fertilization and pest control are also important for sustainable landscaping. In conclusion, the important factors to consider when preparing a landscape plan include ways to create the plan, client needs, and purpose for the landscape, analysis of the site and its use, proper plant material selection, and plant arrangement in the landscape.